All right. Thanks for your patience, class. I'll set these up as we go along. <laughs> um, they uh, sent me the digital results of your te exam uh, yesterday afternoon, so I redid them so I could post them in WebAssign. Uh, I already know that four of you for sure, I've already contacted them. Uh, there seems to be a glitch in the score. I haven't figured it out yet. Two others of you have uh, approached me saying it seems like what I marked versus what was recorded is different. Uh, I'll be able to verify these things once I get the actual bubble sheets back, the physical ones, so I can compare. But that means makes me want to encourage you to uh, go check. <laughs> Send me an email with your name so I can get, when the bubble sheets get here, I can, I can see if maybe they just, there was a glitch in the system and they need to rescan them all. I don't know, but we'll get you, the, the bubble sheets won't lie, and in theory they're somewhere in transit. But the solutions are posted, and your current scores are posted. <laughs> Hopefully they're all they're okay, except for those four. Four students, uh, I got two scores for. <laughs> I haven't figured that out yet. I have scores, I just don't know which one to give them. So we'll, we'll work that out. Uh, second. A friendly reminder, and I strongly encourage you to fill out the survey. I mentioned Wednesday, the, uh, there's a mid-semester online survey about this class, brief, uh, how you think things are going. That'll help me out a lot. It's totally anonymous. I won't know who said what. I just, I hate getting to the end of a semester, then hearing everybody's uh, good or bad criticisms and realizing there's nothing I can do about it then. I don't know why you waited till the end to tell me. So. I chose to do one in the middle, and maybe I can nip something in the bud. So I think it ends uh, through this week, weekend. So I encourage you to check your official UID University email and complete that. Thank you kindly. And that's that. We ended last time with uh, temperature and heat. So we were talking about what's temperature? Measure of kinetic energy. Is it, is it, is it a measure of the total kinetic energy? Very good. It's a measure of the average translational kinetic energy. Important. It doesn't tell you the total kinetic energy. Just their energy of displacement, getting moved around. Again, things can, can rotate like a water molecule. It can, it can twist. It can vibrate. It can oscillate. But we want the moving, the translating, the translational. And it's an average. Some can be going fast at one point. Another slow. Sound effects help. On the average, that's what temperature is, a measure of that. So temperature does not tell you all the internal energy of a material. Internal energy is the total. Count all that other motion and potential energy and the bonding energy and all that. That's included with internal energy, but temperature is not, measure, is not a measure of that. It's more how fast they're moving around. And heat, what's heat? I heard so. It's a transfer of energy, good job. I want you to emphasize, an object does not contain heat. Don't think of that. In the normal, the norm, normal non-physics world, people like to think, ah, this has a certain temperature you can measure. It must contain so much heat. A stove contains heat. No, 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 this is false. Don't think of an object as containing heat. To help me, um, it's, I still fall into it sometimes, work. It's easier for me to think of something does not possess work. Kate, you, you don't possess, you can do work, or you can do work on something. Or if I push this off the table, it has the potential to do work, because it has potential energy, and I can convert it to kinetic energy. And so it just 
Earth did work on pulling it down, and it did work on the floor when it hit it. But it doesn't possess work. Likewise, it does not possess heat. It possesses internal energy. And if, uh, uh, to make it simpler, an ice cube possesses internal energy. But we can release some of that, and some of that energy can be transferred out. That's heat. Energy in transit. And what makes that energy flow? Because heat just doesn't flow willy-nilly. The only time heat flows is when? See, we mentioned it last time. It is in the book. Let's see if anybody's got it. A change in temperature. Energy won't transit or flow unless there's a difference in temperature. If two things are in the same temperature, there will be no heat. Transfer of energy. So if the heat is flowing, you know there's got to be a temperature difference. And it'll keep flowing until they become the same temperature. Because if this is hot and this is cold, the energy will go which direction? Point. Hot. Cold. Yeah, I don't see anybody pointing it that way. It always flows from the hotter to the colder. And that means some in internal energy is transferring over to here, heat. Until this one rises in temperature, this one decreases in temperature, they become the same temperature and heat doesn't flow anymore, and we say it's in thermal equilibrium. Okay. The units of heat, I didn't get to erasing the boards. Lovely sound. Heat is energy in transit. transit. What did the energy before have units of? Really, nobody. Energy, kinetic energy, potential energy, and work had what uh, units? Do you remember? Yeah, so that kinetic energy, potential energy, work, and now heat. It's usually represented with a Q, so that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, they're in joules. And another common one is calorie. Two different units for the same thing, for energy, with heat transfer. Uh, with food, they like to use calories. To get, give you an idea, a calorie is, let's see, uh, one calorie is about 4.2 joules, to give you an idea. Your book also mentions uh, still common in America, BTU, British Thermal Unit, British Thermal Unit, and it is a big one. That's over a thousand joules. That's used a lot with like gas and things, propane tanks or something. This is the standard unit, but a lot of Americans are more familiar with calories. And food calories, you know, something, you look on the box, What's typical? You eat a muffin. A muffin's how many calories? Bazillion. Bazillion, yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't know. Let's, I know there's a, well, anyway. Let's say uh, you read on the uh, package, 2,000 calories. That, that's like a normal person's daily allotted allowance <laughs> in one muffin or something, or maybe it's a Carl's Jr. burger. I don't know. Uh, they use big C's. Food calories are big C's. Physics, it's a little c. And uh, one big c calorie is a thousand little c calories. My point is, when you see 2,000 calories on a food package, that's really 2,000 times a thousand little calories. 200,000 little calories, which is what? 800,000 joules. The point is, food contains, contains, possesses what? Thank you. You didn't say heat. <laughs> yeah, it contains a lot of inner, internal energy. And if all of that could be transferred out as heat, it, it can it do a lot. <laughs> but realize that when you're looking at your food package. Oh, 50 calories. Oh, wait, that's 50,000 calories. That's 20,000 joules. Maybe you're less likely to eat it. I don't know. I uh, see. Did it do? Did that? Did it? Okay. There's a good picture in your book. Yeah.
So we got a body over here, a whole a big bucket, let's say, of water. And then a little cup of really hot water. Which one do you think has more internal energy? Oh, we're mixed. Which one do you think has the higher temperature? The hot one. Yeah, this has a bigger temperature. Hot, cold temperature. In terms of energy, though, it's, it's uh, the other term on temperature was a measure of average translational kinetic energy per molecule of the substance. This does not have as many molecules. So it, each individual molecule has an average, higher average translational kinetic energy, thus the temperature's higher. But there's not as many of them as over here. And I know that the, uh, the amounts of, of uh, mass that you have is compared to the difference in temperature, you can get this to be different things, but I think you get the point. A big bucket of warm water and a little cup of hot water, this actually has more internal energy because there's more molecules. They're not moving as fast necessarily, but there's more of them to get, help get, a, get that difference across between in, difference between internal energy and temperature. Which way will heat flow? If we mix those two, it always goes from the hotter to the colder. So heat will flow this direction. And so the hot cup of water will lose some internal energy and the cup will gain. Even though it's bigger and has, could have, most likely has, more internal energy. It doesn't flow in the direction of who's bigger and who's got more energy. It flows between hot to cold, the temperature. And if you remember that from the jo jostling atoms, I don't have to turn it on. You'll probably just remember. <laughs> remember this guy? Wait, Jay, you around? If you mix those two, then the, which ones are moving faster? The hot. So when they're in contact with this, they're going to collide and have collisions, transfer in kinetic energy and momentum. And these guys are going to slow down a little when they run into these guys, and these guys will s speed up. So do you see how this guy's temperature rises and this guy's temperature falls? Because there's transfer of energy. That's how it gets transferred. So I got a clicker question on this. See if you got it now. So you grab your clickers out. Okay, pulling's open, go. That's good enough. Channel 44, if you forgot again. I know, I, I, we just discussed this. I, we'll just see if uh, I explained it well and you're listening. <laughs> Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You're still scrambling, some of you. Okay. Ninety-eight percent of you think it's B. Very good. Good. You got it. <laughs> All right. Let's go for this one. Polling is open. Same quantity of heat is added to different amounts of water. So picture two different sized containers on a stove, you know. The temperature of the smaller amount of water will do what? So you get a big pot of water, small pot of water, put them on a stove, apply the same heat. What happens to the smaller container of water? 
I mean, they're the same size container, but in different amounts of water. Do you think they will both eventually boil? Yeah. Just use your intuition. Would you, will one come to boiling quicker than the other? Does one get to a higher temperature? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and. Most of you, 93% think B, you're right, very good. So energy is being transferred to both of them. There's less water in the small one, There's less molecules. So they can all share the energy among them. And so they each individually get more. The bigger one, they have to spread it out if you want to think of it. It'll, the temperatures will rise with both. It'll be faster though with the smaller because there's less of them to transfer the heat to. Does that make sense? They're both going to get to boiling and eventually have the same temperature. When they're both boiling, which I should ask this one too. Let's say they're both at 100 degrees now, Celsius, and they're boiling. Which one has more energy? Good, the bigger one. Let's see if you can get this one. Half a cup, you raise it four degrees. How will the temperature go up if it was a full cup? And you did the same thing, same amount of heat added. You can think back to the last question. You got like uh, a, a big pot and full of water and uh, only half full of water. Apply the same amount of heat. First one it goes up four degrees. How about in the second case? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and 70 percent think B. Very good. Somebody explain that one that got it right. Want it, James? Go ahead. Basically, it's temperature per particle, so if there's twice as many particles with the same amount of heat, it's going to be half as much because it's split up by twice as much. Good. There, there's half as much. I mean, the second time, there's twice as much. So for the same amount of heat going in, yeah, it won't raise the temperature, the average translational kinetic energy per molecule as much. And if half as much heat went in, you'll only raise it half as far. Now this works because it's water. They were both water. And I can't do the next slide until I teach some more. <laughs> so. Yes. So, you know how, like, heat, like, like, frequencies, like, you warm up, like, you get whatever, like, you both have the ability to be at the same temperature. Does the time affect? Yeah, they'll take different amounts of time. Yeah, because they'll heat up at different rates. You can see, for the same amount of heat going in, too, the, the smaller one got to a higher temperature before the, 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 the more water. And so, yeah, this one heats up more quickly. But it can, yeah, the, eventually they're both going to get to boiling. It'll just take one longer. Yeah. And that's power. Do you remember power, what power is? Work over time. More generically, now you can think of it in, in, in uh, everything. Work is that transfer of, of energy, right? Something has the potential to do work and transfer energy. It's, it's energy per time. The rate at which energy is used. And so these rates are different. And so the power could be different. Just like work you do on something, you can transfer energy. Heat is transfer of energy. But how fast you do that is the power. And that's usually how we get charged. Electricity, you get charged at the rate that we use energy, electrical energy. A 100 watt light bulb tells you how fast you're going to use energy. Not necessarily how much, just how quickly. So hopefully this makes a little more sense. 
And we did a uh, air balloon and it popped, but the water balloon did not. It was right at the end, so I thought I'd revisit it. The candle is hot. The temperature's high. It has internal energy that is transferring to the colder balloon. Where's the energy going? Into the water. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. The uh, rubber is not absorbing the energy. It's going into the water. The water has a uh, higher, what we call, specific heat capacity. It's the next term. Lovely. In physics, it's usually a little c. It's the uh, quantity of heat. Uh, it's the, it, yeah. What the Quantity of heat needed to raise the temperature of something. to change the temperature by one degree Celsius for a certain mass of something. You got so much of something, if you want to raise it one degree, then you have to transfer so much energy, heat, to it. That's what specific heat capacity is. Water has a large, quite large specific heat capacity. That means in order to get water to raise one, one gram, one gram of, of water, one Celsius degree, you got to apply one, uh, I'm sure I'm saying it right. Yeah, that's right, it's one, it's one joule. No, it's one calorie. That's how they did that. Sorry, doesn't matter. Point is, you add so much heat, for water, you got to add a lot more heat for water, a given amount of water to raise its temperature, as opposed to metal. You, you know this. You put water on the stove, it takes a while for its temperature to go up. You put a piece of metal on the stove, it's going to get hot a lot quicker. Metals typically have a very low specific heat capacity. Because that, that tells me it needs less heat to change its temperature. Brick on a stove, okay. But I would think the molecules would be moving already faster. Molecules are moving in any object. Right. And how fast they're moving okay, is the temperature. So if you have a, a metal brick, a metal rod, a concrete brick, and some water, if they're all at 30 degrees Celsius, then their average translational kinetic energy is exactly the same. They're moving the same speed. Doesn't mean they have different energies, that would depend on their mass. And this is more specific to how much heat does it take to, to change that temperature, to get them to that temperature or away from that temperature, the rate that we're changing here. I like to think of uh, specific heat capacity as thermal resistance, thermal inertia. Because you guys are familiar with that term. Inertia, property of matter to resist a change in motion, right? Well, this is a property of substances to resist a change in temperature. How are you going to change this temperature? Apply heat or take it away, right? So that's how you can remember specific heat capacity. How much do you need to make that change? And if something has a high specific heat, then it's going to resist the change more, like water. So. In order to change water's temperature, you're going to have to apply more heat because it's going to resist. But why, though, does water have more inertia? Why is it that way? Molecularly, the way it's, it's built. 
Uh, the, the chapter does a good job about this, especially with metals. Metals are generally have lower specific heat capacities, meaning you, you put it under a candle flame, it heats up quickly, doesn't it? It doesn't resist the change very much. So it has a low specific heat, low thermal inertia, because, in general, metals have freer electrons. You have to remember your chemistry with the electrons going around the nucleus, and there's different shells, and the outer ones, there's, they're bonded less. Bottom line is, in metals, generally some of those are bound with less energy and can be free to, to move from one atom to another. That's how electricity gets conducted. But it also allows them also to transfer thermal energy that way from atom to atom to atom. And so basically it kind of can, it can pass and flow in the material with greater ease, if you will. It happens more quickly. There's a term called conductivity as well, how fast it can go through something. We're going to do that uh, next chapter. You know, you heat, the, you, you, you heat one end of a metal rod, the other end will get hot pretty quickly. You eat, heat one end of a wood rod, it's going to take longer. That's the conductivity, how long it takes to But they have different specific heats, how fast they're going to change their temperature in, in the first place. So some hands. When your hand gets cold, you feel like it's stiffening up. Well, yeah, they are, the molecules. If it's getting colder, their temperature drops. And yeah, they're not moving as fast. And it's just, it's just like water. You're mostly water. They start to freeze. Not in here, but yeah, they, they start binding a little closer. And yeah, you know it's harder to bend a rock than it is a liquid. <laughs> Analogy here. <laughs> yeah. There's one over here, I thought. Lay it on me. Ah, yeah, that's phase changes. And you probably know this already. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, polar ice caps, and as they melt, because uh, of global warming. Well, they're, they generally melt because the surroundings getting warmer. There's a larger temperature difference. And so he, more heat begins to flow and out of the ice into the surroundings to cool it off. But when ice, in order to heat it up, you've got to apply energy to it to melt it. But, in, but you can't just like make energy disappear. It always transfers. If one thing's getting colder, something else is getting warmer. Is that helping? And uh, think of it this way. Ice to water, you've got to apply heat, transfer energy to the ice to make it melt. But to freeze, you've got to take energy out of the water to make it freeze. That's affecting the water, but what's happening to the surroundings? Same thing, just in reverse. A refrigerator is a great one, and your book talks about this in the chapters of this unit. Feel the bottom of your refrigerator, or the back. It's, it's warmer than the surrounding room air. I thought a refrigerator was supposed to make it cold. Sure. What's it doing? It's taking the heat out of your food. Okay, see, termed that way, that makes it sound like food contains heat. Sorry. Taking the internal energy and transferring it as heat out. Where does it go? Into your room. If food's going to drop its temperature, that means energy's going somewhere. It goes into the room. So a refrigerator actually warms up your room a little bit. That's all air conditioners and heat pumps do, too. They're just moving thermal energy around. So this formula is like in a footnote in this chapter, but I think it's one of these guides to thinking. So again, not to uh, scare anybody, but heat. We've just now learned that it's proportional to, well, you tell me, what have we learned it's proportional to? What affects it? seems to matter. What makes it happen in the first place? What is, what is heat? It's a transfer of energy because 
So it's going to depend on the, the change in temperature. We've, we've seen that. If, if there's not a difference, it won't happen. Energy won't flow. It also depends on some of the clicker questions. Mass, how much the thing of the thing you have? Because you, you need more heat for uh, more water. Time, no, because that's more the rate, how fast we're going to use it up. But it also matters what the material is, the specific heat capacity. And it actually works out to be exactly that. And if you use all the standard units, you, some of you get into the, if this is joules, then this would be kilograms. Uh, this would be um, uh, Celsius or Kelvin, because it would be the same difference. And C would work into, you always forget, so you can rearrange the formula that way. <laughs> that would be uh, joules per kilogram degree Celsius. <laughs> And yes, that is the unit for specific heat capacity. So you can look them up in a table. But if you want to actually figure out how much heat something takes. So how much of it you have? Again, if you got more of it, you're going to need more heat to have the same change in temperature. More water, it's going to take longer to boil on your stove because you have to apply more heat. Uh, if you're trying to heat up metal instead, it won't take as long. You'll, get, you'll change your temperature faster because this is a smaller number for metal. It has less thermal resistance. Um, so what happens when, like, so say, like, it's an ice cube. Ice cube, okay. Um, and it's melting. There's no temperature difference, so would there be no heat? Very good. Very good. He's saying at ice, and, and this is great because this is where we're leading. Phase changes. I think that's two chapters later. Uh, you got an ice cube and it's melting. So say the ice is negative 10 degrees, you apply heat. That'll change its temperature because there's a certain mass of it. Ice has a certain specific heat capacity. You change its temperature and it gets up to zero degrees. What happens at zero degrees? It melts. While it's melting, the temperature doesn't change until it's melted. Once it's melted and changed into water, now the water, you have mass of water, it's the same mass because you started with the ice. It has a different heat, specific heat capacity and you're going to start raising its temperature up. So what's happening while it's melting? Do you have to apply heat? Yes. Where's that energy going? Not that. And temperature is a measure of? average translational kinetic energy. So it's not going into that. It's going into other stuff. Breaking bonds, making the water tw twist or rotate, all that other internal energy, but not translational kinetic. It's still heat. It's energy, yes. It takes energy to do that, but it doesn't raise the temperature because temperature only measures translational kinetic energy. And so while things are changing phase, melting or boiling or in reverse, while they're doing that, the temperature doesn't change. Heat is still applied. It goes into the, the, what it takes molecularly to make that phase change. And we call those heat of vaporization and heat, heat of fusion. They're in the another chapter. And but since you're on it, they're based on uh, how much mass you have in this thing called latent heat of vaporization or latent heat of um, fusion. And that's dependent on what material you're using like this, in which direction, uh, whether you're melting or vaporizing. We'll learn more about that. But yeah, while, while you're changing phases, that's how you de determine the heat transfer. But while you're changing temperature, that, this is how they're related. So back to the balloon. Water is big. Well, I didn't have much of it in the balloon, but this is really big. The key to why the balloon didn't pop is because for water it has a lot of thermal resistance and so it takes a lot more heat to change the temperature. The water is taking that energy in. Eventually the water will raise its temperature, get hot enough, and it can start transferring that temperature to the balloon and it will pop. 
but it's going to take longer because you need a lot more heat. And that's very useful in this world. Ocean currents, you're, I'm not going to explain it as much here because I think your textbook does a great job of moderating temperatures. If you live next to the beach or a, a lake, you, you probably already know this. Anybody ever done it? What, how do the temperatures compare there if you're farther inland or away from them? Not always it's lower. More, more specific, more stable, less extremes. Because the, you know, it takes a lot of heat in the surrounding areas or cold, lack of heat to change the temperature of the water. So it's going to stay about the same, more. Yeah, if they both heat up, they absorb the heat. This takes more energy to heat up. So it doesn't change its temperature as much. It stays a little more stable in the day. And so you, it kind of helps cool you off. For, we're going to talk more about heat transfer next class. But during the night when it cools off, if it takes longer for water to heat up, it also takes longer for it to cool off. Thermal re inertia, resistance to change in temperature, either direction. And so that can help keep your house warm too because it's right next to it. It kind of stabilizes things out because of its high heat, specific heat. Let's do some demos. Or I'll regret. <laughs> Let's see. Let's do these. This is a bimetallic strip. It's uh, two different materials sandwiched together. I honestly don't know what these two are made out of. Your book uses an example of iron and copper, so let's go with that. One side you can think of as copper and one side as iron. I'm going to heat it up. And you see it bends? When things heat up, you know, I, you know this, do they expand or contract? Yeah, most things expand. But because they're different materials, they have different resistance to the, I just added heat. So one of them changed its temperature more quickly than the other and expanded faster, more than the other one. And if you've got two things fixed together and you're trying to make this one long and this, this one get, wants to get longer faster than this one, it stretches and it makes the thing curve. That's what a biometallic strip is. If you, uh, yeah. Yeah. Cool it off a little faster, it comes back. Another way to show that, you can use it. A lot of thermostats did that. Let's plug in a power supply. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. There we go. So this is making contact through this metal strip right here from one side to the other to complete the circuit so electricity can flow through the white bulb. I'm going to heat the strip up. And what it did is it bent. It went like, say, from being down, connected to the white bulb, to, whoa, I'm bending, bending, disconnected to nothing, and then bent up, and now it's connecting the red one. As it cools back off, it'll bend back the other way, break the connection to the red bulb, keep bending as it cools. Right now it's not touching anything. You keep bending and eventually get back to the white. Is that how, I haven't, is that how cars turn signals work? It could, I don't know myself. Um, if they just heat up really fast and it does this more quickly. It could explain it, something, yeah, the, if you got a really precision close and the thing reacts really quickly, that could do that, but I don't really know if that's how they do that. There we go. So you, it's hot in the room. Your thermostat expands and changes the connection. You can heat these guys up. It expands, stretches out, and you can use it as an indicator, a thermometer, or connect it up somehow and use it as a thermostat. This one. Because things expand. And if you want to control that, 
pick the material you want to see how quickly it, it changes. Remember this uh, gas bulb thermometer? These work because water expands when it gets warmer. So if I, this is warmer water, transferring energy to my hand so to raise its temperature, and I put my warm hand on here, do you expect it to go up or down? Ha ha ha! I, I've he I'm transferring energy to the glass. They, get, they start moving faster. They're in contact with the air molecules inside, make them start moving faster, which increases the pressure up here. And now the pressure is greater here than it is here, trying to atmospheric pressure pushing it back up. So this pressure was winning, and it pushed it down. And as it cools, you can see it rising back up. So kind of a reverse thermometer, but that's how it works. Because water expands. Mercury thermometer, same thing. Mercury expands. What if the, does the glass expand too? A little bit, yeah. What would happen if they both expanded at the same rate? You'd never see a difference, right? Because they'd both change together. And so you would never see a difference in level. So it's a good thing that glass has a higher or lower? Specific heat. Thermal resistance, inertia, does it, it doesn't want to change its temperature as fast, right? So it's resisting more, so it's got a higher specific heat capacity. That's not right. <laughs> I said something wrong. Oh, that's for changing temperature. See, you can get caught up in these things. Glass, I know, has a smaller specific heat capacity than water. Because to raise the temperature of water, you got to uh, a lot. You got to apply more heat. It can take more in. The, the, however, that being said, water expands faster than glass. It is because they're different materials. Just don't look to specific heat for it. It, it, it matters. They change. I'll think about it more to explain it to you. But my point is, they're not the same rate, and that's very important. Glass does not expand as fast as water. That much is true. What if the glass expanded faster? Normal thermometer, make it easier for you. A normal thermometer, when temperature goes up, the, the liquid rises. When temperature gets colder, it, it goes down. What would happen if the glass that that liquid was in expanded faster than the liquid? When it got hotter, we'd actually see it drop because the glass is expanding faster and more quickly around it. So uh, people that build instruments and tools and construction have to worry about thermal expansion. If you build uh, you know, steel rebar through concrete to reinforce it and they expand at different rates for the same heat applied, one, one will cause stress on the other and make it crack. You've seen the, probably the slots and grooves in bridges or the cracks in sidewalks and driveways. Why? So when things heat up and expand or contract, they don't just split. If you make a solid sidewalk, just wait through the seasons, and they'll form their own cracks. Because as they try to expand, I can't, I can't, I can't, and they just bust, or vice versa, as they contract. Another good, oh, I got a question. I'll save that one for next time. Let's do this one. All right, I don't want that. If I heat up, oh, let me show you. This ring fits around this ball. If I heat up the ball, what do you expect to happen? Yeah, that's probably, uh, since you guys, I just heard that and you did very confidently, the ball expands. They're both made out of iron. So they'll expand at the same rate. But if I just heat this one, do you fit? and I do it enough, it won't fit through. So my question to you, I'm going to do it the other way. I'm going to heat the ring. What will happen? The 
the mass is large, even though it's iron, so it takes more heat transfer. What do you think? Won't fit through? I mean, will fit through? Won't. We'll do it again next time, and I'll heat the ball up to convince you it doesn't go through when the ball's heated. But when you heat the ring, does the ring expand? I thought we said when things heat, they expand. But the hole expands too. So if it starts like that, the hole must be getting bigger too. I'm exaggerating. It does get thicker, but to stay a ring, the whole thing has to get expanded. If this gets confusing, I like draw a circle on a, on a piece of paper and then take it to the photocopier and enlarge it. This width gets bigger, doesn't it? Yep. The whole thing gets bigger. Yep. So does the hole. That's what's happening. It's expanding. What if you had uh, this and you heated it up? Would the gap get bigger or smaller or stay the same? That's like doing this. If that's the gap initially, then the gap over here has to get bigger. Because the whole thing is expanding, including the gap. Yeah. The, the life jacket, when it expands. Oh, when you, when you inflate. Oh, inflating a, a, a life vest, yeah, it kind of gets the strangle. That's different because that's due to pressure different, not because it's heating up. Yeah, the metal expands in any direction. Okay, have a great weekend, everybody. Of course, it only expands at